Hello and welcome to another episode of Video Game Logic. Today's episode was recorded on October the 1st, 2019. I'm your host, gaming psychologist, and with me, as always, a genuine and good boy. A caffeine rage, well, as far as you know. On today's show, we will, of course, be discussing the games that we've played this past week. Modern Warfare Special Ops Survival Mode is available only on PS4 for one whole year. Mario Kart Tour Gold Game Pass costs more than Nintendo Switch Online and other services. Rocket League replaces loot crates with loot blueprints. We will have our weekly community corner and a Steam weekly discovery queue. Timestamps will be in the show notes following their respective topics. Hello, Rage. Hello. How you doing? Pretty good. You know, just here. We've only been talking for one minute and ten seconds now. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Sir, totally. Bob. Yeah. Totally haven't been talking for you know like half an hour or something. Totally fresh. Or, or, or actually, just, actually, it's more like an hour. How about that? We, yeah, it is. We haven't just recorded an entire segment for Franken content That's discussing some really fun week. stuff. Yeah, I'm definitely going to use that next week. And the episode <laughs> title is going to be Do the not name, prank the special. Jared. Well, no, it could be that. I was thinking my ten clown dads. <laughs> yeah, but now you're going to have to do even more of uh, about ten clown dads. You're going to have to do, like, a, a, a skit or something since you're going to have you know, a week all to yourself to do anything. Oh, speaking of... Oh, that reminds me. The the only other thing we talked about. Uh, I don't know if I'm going to leave this in the main show or not. So, have you ever seen the Too Many Cooks video? Uh, maybe? It it's familiar. like an intro to a show called Too Many Cooks. It's It's like it's a joke thing. But the intro is, like, 15 minutes long. And it's like, too many cooks, too many cooks. And, like, it winds up with them being, like, in space and, like, traveling through time and, like, all this stuff. And there's a guy, like, that, like, when they're doing the freeze frames, there's this guy who comes in and he's, like, murdering them. It's very weird. But I was, we were talking about a a thing like that being the intro for my Tin Clown Dads. (laughs) (laughs) Too many cooks. Yeah, it's okay. It's 11, 11 minutes long. So I will get you a link so that you can look at it later. Adult Swim did it. Oh, well. I didn't know that part. I just discovered that right now. But here's your link, and you can go watch it later. Oh, no, we're uh, we're going to have 11 minutes uh, of just sounds, and we're going to uh, watch it right now. We're doing it live. We, we've done that before, <laughs> but no, not today. Um,. So yeah, we that we talked about that, and all of that will be discussed more thoroughly in next week's Franken episode, because we've talked about this, I think, on the show before, but why don't you tell the good, good folks where you're going, Well, Rach? I'm going to hell. I'll wait. <laughs> already there. <laughs> yeah, already there. You know, uh, especially if I prank Jared, you know, I'm definitely going to hell. It, it, he's yeah, going to be your personal demon. I'm going to fucking kill you. Uh, especially if uh, I use that box I showed you. Yeah. I, I, after you I peel yourself from the ceiling. Spoilers for next week, y'all. I don't like pranks. I don't like being pranked. <laughs> so you'll learn more about that so, in the Franken show. There's an anime con that's uh, in a town near me that I'm going to be attending. And it's I'm going to be out well away from studio, apartment, uh, my living uh, uh, quarters. Uh, from Thursday to Sunday, and because I usually post the show on a Thursday, that's going to make things a little bit difficult. So it was easier just to go do a franking show and be able to do it earlier in the week. So I'm going to have a long ke- weekend with my girlfriend at an anime con. Mwah. Beautiful sentence. So yeah, next week there will be a franken show, which is fine. Um, we've got like three or four shows worth of Franken content in the can, maybe more. I'm not sure. Um, cause it really, how much we get per episode kind of varies. Um, sometimes it's five, 10 minutes. Sometimes if we start Craig early, it's a half an hour. And sometimes it's an entire episode. It's like, okay, we'll just run uh, the silence reducer and uh, that's it. Right. Yeah. So we, we've got a good 10 to 15 minutes out of uh, 10 Clown Dads and 
my feelings on pranks. So that's like a good quarter of a Franken episode because those are usually only between 45 minutes and an hour. So, but yeah, that's what we'll be doing next week. And that works out for me too because I'm having a little outpatient surgery Mm -hmm. next Friday, which, you know, honestly, like it doesn't affect me as much because I usually have the edit done on Wednesday and I don't, I very rarely actually have it prepared to post on YouTube on Friday, so. But it makes it easy. I don't have to pretend this week. (laughs) (laughs) Or next week, I guess. Next week, I don't have to pretend. So. But yes, indeed. That will be what we shall be doing. Um, But how about we talk about what we have done this past week, Rage, in the world of gaming. What games have you played? Well, I only had one solo game because I, once again, had a very busy weekend. So, I've went to Mars uh, in my gaming or my solo gaming and hey I survived. Yeah. So, well that's good. I, I survived Did Mars. You eat potatoes? Surviving Mars. Yeah, I got my ass to Mars and then I ate potatoes. <laughs> you know, uh, crossing my references now. So, Surviving Mars, it's a management building game colony builder where you're building a colony on Mars. How about that? And I haven't done ton with it just yet so i'm just still in the early game and i will say that the tutorial does give a good overview of the different essentially stages there's essentially three separate stages that your colony goes through and i'm still in the initial build-up phase so in the first phase you have robots and you're essentially Mm -hmm. building the infrastructure that will support your colonists later on And it's kind of a slow burn if you don't get lucky with your landing site. And unfortunately, I didn't get lucky. So I've had to spend a fair amount of time hunting for resources. So uh, uh, Surviving Mars is a paradox game. So there's an absolute ton of DLC. There's a bunch of little things. Unfortunately, I'm playing it on Game Pass. So I have the base version and that's about it. No, I think I have the, yeah, I do have the free DLC over there, which is just a couple more anomalies. So the idea of surviving Mars is you're building up a Mars base and it's kind of a mixture of realistic, but sci-fi elements because they have mm-hmm. the, uh, you know, the traditional sci-fi bubble domes, but then they bring in a more realistic, like building system with all the drones uh, setting up the base before the colonists get there. Uh, they have a little bit more realistic technology levels. So it's kind of this weird just position between the two. Especially whenever you start getting into the colony aspect of uh, with uh, the humans coming in. Because to me, whenever I think space colony, particularly a science outpost, I think of things like the Martian, where it's essentially space station, only it's landed. Yeah, very enclosed, very tight, very, uh, very almost submarine-like, where there's not really a lot of wasted space. And this, because they go with sort of the sci-fi-esque element with the bubble domes and having proper housing, it's either feels like a mixture of distant future, future or a little bit of retrofuturism. Because mm-hmm. of that kind of unrealistic element next to this very grounded area, you know? Yeah. But it's an interesting take on things, mostly because I haven't really encountered a space builder like this that's been very good. They've been either very boring or they've been very restrictive and this particular one at least in the beginning it is a very slow burn especially if you get unlucky with the resources like i said but they also offer a lot of options to be able to shake things up or make things more difficult on yourself so for example uh, different countries could be your sponsor for the space uh, uh, adventure you know your space expedition Mm-hmm. And they may make you more well funded, which will allow you to get more supplies back from Earth to be able to kind of boost yourself up. You may be essentially a a, a colony being sent out to you know sur- uh, to survive some sort of 
global apocalypse. So, you know, you're going to be cut off from Earth very quickly. Uh, the technologies that you start off with also vary on your background and on the uh, uh, your sponsor. So you may start off with you know, very little technology, very little money, and you're just trying to piece together a little bit of a colony to be able to send supplies back to Earth to be able to fund more research. And that's really the name of the game is trying to establish yourself and be able to set up Really, mining seems to be the main thing here. Where, yay! Yeah, I know, I know. You just uh, you just got sold on this game. I was already sold on this game. I don't have it, but it's been on my wish list for a you while. You have this. It's on Game Pass. Oh, I didn't know that. I said it was on Game Pass. I said I was playing the base version because of Game Pass. Oh, I I missed you say the word Game Pass. Yeah, I've been playing this on uh, Xbox Game Pass. Well, shit. I guess I'm installing it. <laughs> <laughs> Not right now, but later. Uh, so, uh, let's see, where was I? Oh, yeah. Uh, in order to fund yourself once you essentially establish your base, the main way I've seen is to either get research, which uh, uh, gives more bonuses later on, or just essentially set up mining bases to ship resources back to Earth to sell to boost your funding to be able to buy stuff assuming that your particular rule set that you set up for the game has that option but what's kind of interesting is they also have a very rim world-esque uh planetary uh system where uh different regions of mars have different resources and different hazards there's four main hazards there's dust storms there's meteors uh there's uh, there's cold snaps, which essentially uh, make your energy requirements go sky high. And I'm blanking on the fourth one, unfortunately. Uh, did I say meteors? No. Okay, meteors. That's the fourth one. So. Uh, it came to me. Meteors, uh, which you know, uh, can be a double-edged sword. They can wipe out a portion of your base, but they can also bring down some lovely, lovely resources. So, uh, like I said, it's a, been a very interesting game. Uh, I'm still in the early game in my sandbox play. And there's this like this weird combination of, you know, okay, this feels very grounded. This feels very scientific. Okay, your next step, build a bubble dome. What? <laughs> well, doming off areas of Mars, though, would probably be the best way to try to colonize it on a larger scale. Uh, on one of the podcasts I listen to suggests doming off uh, craters. That way you don't have to build so much of a sort of an air yeah. glass dome. Yeah, that's very true. But at the same time, uh, all the more realistic options I've seen uh, for colonizing Mars for a larger scale have evolved cave Lava networks. Tubes. Yeah. Yeah. But if you're going to go for a surface, a glass dome is about the best, well, air quotes, glass. You wouldn't want to use actual glass. You'd want to use some kind of composite. But yeah, that would be the best way to do it. <clears throat> there have been some suggestions, though, that you could uh, transform some of the lower craters into habitable zones by creating small atmospheres in them, sort of building up the sides of the, the craters to help keep any atmosphere in. And then you wouldn't even need a dome, yeah. Aside from radiation, but if you could create some kind of electromagnetic sphere, uh, uh, shield, yeah. uh, essentially build a small version of what the planetary, uh, what the planet's natural uh, electromagnetic field would have been. Yeah, I've seen some really cool stuff, or, or heard about some really cool stuff, some ideas and concepts, all grounded in real science. Yeah. And just one of those, like, we know how to make this work. Just doing it right now is impractical. We would need some other technological improvements to make this more real, uh, more achievable. Yeah, which I, I don't think they go as far as terraforming, at least as far as I've seen. I did go for a randomized tech tree to you know, make things a little bit more interesting for me. Mm -hmm. uh, where certain techs are always in the low tiers. But the way you unlock technology is... As well, first of all, you uh, land, you know, like you do, right? And Mars is uh, also well, one of those annoying planets that has just enough gravity so that 
you know, a power landing is annoying, but enough atmosphere where, yeah, you, know, you could just barely use a parachute, but it uh, creates enough of a, a heat, uh, atmospheric heating, shock heating, uh, mm-hmm. that, yeah, it's a pain in the ass. <laughs> so you have essentially Elon Musk ask, uh, you know, star hoppers come down and, uh, bring your supplies, but you, coordin- uh, you basically, block off a portion of the Martian surface and you have one section of it that's been scanned. And as the game progresses, you're slowly unlocking scans of the other areas and there's anomalies that uh, uh, appear that <clears throat> allow technological breakthroughs. There's story-based missions that will give you uh, also technological breakthroughs. Occasionally they'll give you just tech points that'll allow you to research uh, sometimes I'll pop up with you finding a long lost, uh, Mars mission. As a matter of fact, uh, on my sandbox play, the first anomaly was Beagle 2, which was a crashed, I believe it's a British probe, if memory serves correctly. Now I'm gonna have to, to uh, to look that up. Uh, Beagle 2. Beagle probe. 2. Yeah, British. Was a British, uh, lander. Oh. Uh, yeah. Uh, had a malfunction on landing, which is what they said, but they didn't say which country it was. So, uh, points for me, I guess. Yay. But I found Beagle 2, which uh, unlocked a robotics, uh, uh, tech upgrade because of, uh, the long-term exposure of radiation on the remains of the probe unlocked a certain way of thinking. Uh, to uh, allow for a, a certain amount of tech advancement. So there's that where you're going through the surface as you uh, scan more of the surface, finding these anomalies. Sometimes they're uh, things like that. Sometimes they're uh, a choice of a rare resource or one of two or three different deposits. Sometimes the story comes up and uh, depending on which one you take, because that is also like another adjustment knob for the overall difficulty of the game. Uh, as I take a drink of water, uh, sometimes uh, they give you stuff because they're just launching something past Mars orbit and can just drop it off on the way. And sometimes uh, it's, well, you need to analyze this in order to progress a little bit more. Uh, to put in like a little bit of a stopgap. Where I got thrown a wrench was I did not have a water deposit nearby. So... I'm having to rely on essentially condensing the Martian atmosphere into water, which is slow and does not give a lot of resources. So I'm wanting to build up my uh, infrastructure a little bit more before I start constructing bubble dumps. So I'm going a, probably a little bit slower than the game really intends me to do so. But overall, it hasn't felt like I've been in any real danger. So it's been an interesting experience just because it's kind of like almost a chillax uh, uh, survival game, survival uh, colony management game, which is weird because usually there's some sort of external pressure, but I haven't felt that yet. But then again, it's Mars, so there's not a lot of external pressure. Sorry. <laughs> you're, just, you're just shaking your head on that one, aren't you? I am, but it's okay. It's an audio podcast, Jared. Audio. <laughs> audio show. Audio podcast, everybody. Um, as a, I mean, I'm definitely going to play this this weekend. I don't know if I'll talk about it, depending on how different I may feel about it compared to you next time we record. Yeah. But I'm definitely going to play it this weekend. Um, I've, I've always wondered if, I mean, if one of these games exists, I don't know, but why they don't make a game that focuses on more... I don't know if, what the right word is to use. Attainable or realistic aspects? Like, you think about, you know, there certainly would be benefits to creating colonies on Mars or on the moon. But a- anytime you create a-, a colony on another gravity well, you then start running into the problems that we've had with getting off of Earth. And to some extent, the technology we would have created will probably help. But why not build... Uh, a lot more space habitats utilizing spin gravity and things like that. Like you're still going to be using r- roughly the same amount of materials to build an entire colony versus building a ha- uh, some type of space station. 
um, like an O'Neill cylinder or something like that. Yeah, well, the problem with that is that, once again, you're running into the problem of gameplay versus realism or realism sci-fi-esque, where realism sometimes just isn't fun. That's fair. Uh, I mean, I really want to play some boring, realistic games, though. Well, I mean, I've well, been playing well, <laughs> a fucking mobile uh, air airline tycoon game for, and I'm playing with it on live time scale, and I'm like loving the shit out of it. Just slide that one in there again. I've I've got over twelve hours in that mobile game. That's more than I play some PC you, or you console know, I think games. you need an intervention at this point. It's really good. <laughs> It's really, I've, I've borrowed almost a billion dollars, but I'm still turning a profit. My credit rating keeps going up. The banks keep telling me I can have more money. Eventually, I could have a crisis, but for now, I'm doing great. Well, I, I think the reason uh, just is that outside of, uh, damn, what is that one space station builder? It's not space base. There's a first person one that's you're literally building up all the systems and I'm blanking on the name of it. It was really big on Twitch for a while. I'm searching to see if I can find it. Uh, Workshop space games space themed. I'm blanking on it. It was really popular for a short time but then it's kind of dropped off. I'm not sure if it's just uh, you know, it just hasn't seen updates or if it's, you know, it was a flavor of the week for like, you know, a, you know, a couple weeks and that was it. Uh, um, just, oh yeah, uh, uh, the best space games and, you know, uh, throw a bunch of games that are hardly space games. Uh, yeah, I'm not seeing on here. Ooh. Yeah, I don't, I don't know what game you're talking about, so I don't, I don't think I've heard of it. It was very much like uh, uh, Space Engineers, only it was more focused on the systems of life support. So, building up uh, uh, your space uh, station, essentially from the skeletal skeleton up. Stationeers? Maybe that's it. Hang on. I don't know, I'm just looking at a list of games that are supposed to be similar to Space Engineers. Let me take a look at Stationeers, because... I think that might be it, actually. Yeah, that's it, Stationeers. It's more focused on uh, the life support aspect and building a proper space station. Mm -hmm. It's supposed to be actually really good. I'm not sure if it's just fallen off uh, the radar, or uh, it's still in early access. Looks like it released into early access at December 2017. So it's going to be uh, two years in early access this December. Yeah, when was the last time it updated, though? Looks like they're focusing on DLC, which is not a good sign. Nope. But, yeah, that's probably the more realistic version of a space station builder is just it's focused on systems yeah, sort of like oxygen not included that's another good example of it a very system based even though yeah, oxygen not included is not realistic at all in its overall theme of the underlying science of it where there's proper air di- uh, dynamic or uh, gas dynamics, there's proper fluid dynamics, you have to worry about uh, proper waste management, food uh, generation. That's a lot more realistic Mm -hmm. than surviving Mars where you you put down a hydroponic uh, station and that's pretty much it for as long as you're under a certain population. So uh, it's just different flavors of the same general idea, but I haven't seen one that's gone super realistic because even stationers, it's, you know, has a a kind of uh, sci-fi theme. Mm -hmm. So, you know, not quite what we're looking for, but then again, you're running into the whole, you know, gameplay versus realism. And we haven't really seen a 
sim for this type of game. At least not that we are aware of. Yeah, there true. might be one that exists, but I mean, not, we've never heard of it. Yeah, very true. Cool. But yeah, I, yeah, I would say I would say if you, over the course yeah, of the next two weeks. Yeah, I would say if you're interested in uh, you know uh, space and especially building a colony on another planet, uh, yeah, you know, surviving Mars is definitely a, something to worth looking at because it does have the general systems. It's just it feels a little too sci-fi for me. To not that that's such a bad thing. It's just it's not quite what I was looking for, particularly whenever they start talking about anomalies and you know. St. Elmo's Fire and that sort of thing. Even St. Elmo's Fire. Oh, please don't. Please don't. (laughs) Okay. Uh, Shut up and talk about Warframe. Right. So I left Warframe on there from last week. Uh, We played that for Community Game Night last week and this week. Um, Yeah, somebody's got hooked again. After playing it last week, I was like, okay, I remember why I like this game, but there's so much that has changed and so much that I've forgotten So I played it a bit over the weekend. Um, You had suggested to go to Venus and do the starting quest line. Yeah, uh, let's see. If it's get your ass to Mars, get your balls to Venus. I don't know. Sure. I got got my dick to Venus uh, and played through the... Well, you're going to end up with a binarial disease. Nah. Nah. But played through, what is it, Ord Vallis? Yeah, uh, it's or, uh, or Fortuna and Ord Vallis. Ord Vallis. So I played through that and basically used that like a little tutorial to sort of get myself used to the open world system a bit better, retool some of my builds, um, play around with some new stuff that I had gotten at some point. I don't remember when, but I got uh, some equipment, some gear, and then we came back and played it again Monday night and... Um, the biggest thing was I had gotten the, what's it called, the, the K-Drive? K-Drive, uh, essentially hoverboard. Yeah, I had the hoverboard. And while your hoverboard was faster, the hoverboard in general is a lot faster than doing the sprint slide jump thing. Um, and you can go across water much more easily. That was good. But I'm starting to build rep, uh, faction rep, with the faction there. Uh, two of them, actually. One of them, what did you say the, the kids were? Uh, they're uh, Fink board. Kids and uh, Solaris United. Yeah. So, I'm, I'm working on that. And uh, it's good. And now that I've got a little bit better grasp on the open world stuff, I definitely need to go through and complete some of the older story content that I haven't yet. Um, to get some stuff that I know that I'm missing, like some ab- abilities and things. But as far as, like getting used to the open world system and uh you you showed me a couple of other things like how to sell like some excess stuff so i went from having no money to having barely uh, any money some money uh enough money to do a couple of things once i log in and play some more yeah Um, uh which keep at least thirty thousand on you all right because we're gonna go do something uh, uh sometime soon that's how much you said you needed to have for the wager thing. Yeah, uh, there's a wager that's uh, basically the best way to generate money in the game. And it's, uh, well, you could leave after one and get 70000 or you could stay in and, you know, get more and more. But, you know, since you're so low, you know, definitely leave after the first one and then start building up. Yeah. Melee is still my best thing, but I completely changed my entire melee build. Um, and then I've got a sniper rifle for the open world areas and I'm just leveling up some secondary weapons that I had while I, uh, get resources to try out some of the new stuff. So, but I mean, it's good. It's, I, I felt like it was good last time getting back into it, but now I remember what the fuck and how the fuck. So it's good. Fuck. Good. The fuck. It's a good. So I'll be playing more of it. Oh yeah, I'll, I'll be playing Poor more of Katie. it along. Wink. But I'll, I'll be playing more of it along, and uh, I mean, I doubt that I'll ever catch you. I don't know if I would just put that much time into it. Oh but, well, I mean, I'm definitely... uh, well, I'm focused on Forza right now, so I'm not doing too much right now. Yeah, but when it comes to to gaming, I don't have as much time. I don't think as you do. Like throughout the week, you have a lot more time than I, I do to play games the weekend it's a lot more even 
your weekends have been taken up with other things, but you know, uh, your new relationship. Yeah, but, but personal relationships before gaming. That is very true. But you know, as that relationship ages, you guys will have shifts in your activities and things. So yeah. Plus, uh, we also are both gamers, so we'll definitely be playing games together. At least that's my hope for it. Yay! Yeah, my player too. But uh, yeah, so that's Warframe. Uh, I played two other games this week, continuing on. Well, one of these is a key mailer game, and one of them is a free to play game. Um, so I think I may have seen it somewhere. But anyways, I'll start with the key mailer game. It's called Sky of Destruction. Um, this is made by the same people who. What was that other playing game I talked about a couple of weeks ago? Uh, I don't know. They kind of all blend together after a while. Aircraft Evolution. This is the same developer that made Aircraft Evolution, and apparently they made this game first. Uh, Sky of Destruction is a top-down, sort of twin-stick shooter-esque style uh, game where that you are playing one of six different aircraft, um, and you've got like a sky carrier that you launch from. And there's various objectives based on what the map is. Typically, they revolve around destroying something, um, although it might be defending something from destruction. Um, and you have mo- different ways that you can load out everything. So everything is fairly highly customizable. There's six different aircraft in total. You start with three of them, and then you unlock the other three by collecting blueprint shards as you play. And you get basically enough blueprints to fill up the silhouette of the aircraft and then it unlocks it for you and then you get a shitload of upgrade modifiers that go into that space uh let's see i think it's in one of the screenshots shows it uh yeah so the third screenshot has got a picture of one of the aircraft and you can see like this little grid system um where that you can drop these upgrades into and there are a bunch of different upgrades that do different things like increase your attack power increase speed uh, weapon damage. There's things that let you have more of them on your carrier, so you've got a larger fleet. Um, there's some that completely change or add weapons. There's some with some weirder effects. All of sort of the baseline ones or the sort of small, cheap ones that you can slot in are pretty small effects, like plus 10% weapon damage or uh, plus 5% speed or something like that. Um, but they get they can get pretty wacky at higher levels Um, and you can do that for each of the aircraft Um, you can take three different aircraft types into battle with you and each of them can be customized fully in that way your carrier can be customized you can upgrade it in a bunch of different ways armor uh, capacity weapons weapon types the amount of aircraft they can carry on board Um, there's a few straight upgrades most things have a trade-off Um, You can straight armor and weapon upgrades are there, but something that maybe gives you more aircraft to carry, the trade-off is you have less armor because you're sort of carving out some additional space to put more aircraft on board. So there's a few special abilities and special weapons you can get and unlock. Um, Things like, think like Starcraft, or not Starcraft, Star Fox Smart Bomb, where it clears like the entire screen or special missile types or the ability to call in reinforcements to your location. Um, instead of them just kind of flying around on the map. Um, battles go, like I said, there's different objectives usually that involve destroying all the targets or taking out a specific target or defending something. Um, and these three aircraft types that you take into battle, they have different amounts of planes that can that can come in. Uh, for example, the standard fighter by default can have 50 planes per slot. So if you took three slots full of fighters, you'd have 150 planes. And the AI will launch and control those planes, and then you can choose whichever one you want to fly around. And there's different limits on how many aircraft can be launched at once based on the aircraft type, um, and certain ones have different strengths and weaknesses. The fighter, for example, is really fast, but it has weak weapons. The Raptor is designed for an anti-aircraft role, so it's got uh, guided missiles and a really powerful rapid-firing machine gun, but it's a little bit slower. And then... What's the, the really big one called that you start with? I think it's called the Vulture um, or something like that. Uh, and it is a really big, slow, heavy aircraft that's designed to destroy bases, but it's weak to fighters. 
Um, and then there's, like I said, there's three other ones. Uh, I've only unlocked one of them, which is sort of a hybrid fighter and attack craft. So it can do better damage to both fighter planes and ground-based defenses. And uh, the battle plays out, and you just destroy everything, um, or d destroy your target or defend your target based on whatever the objective is. The AI controls all of the planes that launch from your carrier, except for the one that you're actively flying. Um, anytime that you die, you can swap planes. As far as I know, there's no way to sort of return to base and swap out. You have to die for that. Um, uh, well, a silly thing to die a, for, I mean. I know. But, uh, and that's generally the gist of the game. Um, there's a little bit of a story to it. Uh, great war after uh, sort of an apocalyptic scenario and you're trying to secure territories and collect resources for your side in the war um, but I don't know if there's more to it other than that um, you can play there's sort of a grid map that you can see in one of the other screen screenshots it's kind of towards the middle of the list um, and the map is kind of randomized um, so you might have all everything clumped together, or you might have distinct sort of branching paths to follow out. And the farther away you get from the originating point, the harder the missions get. You can replay missions to get stuff to upgrade, um, either to, to farm uh, upgrades, blueprints, or just straight up cash to purchase uh, certain upgrades and special items and equipment. It's a fun game. It's simple, um, but... I enjoyed it uh, after I played their other game, um, Aircraft Evolution. After I played that one and I enjoyed that and, and felt kind of the same. Like, it's a fun game. It's pretty simple, but it controls well. Um, it, it will run on any old potato. Um, this game feels Even the same. Even a potato you on Mars? Yes, especially a potato you'd eat on Mars. Um, but this game feels the same in a sense of like, it's simple, it's fun, it's intuitive, it'll run on a potato. Um, the only thing is, is that it's not, I don't think it's worth the purchase price. This is a solid like buy on deep discount game. Um, two or three bucks for the most part, maybe five. I might get see, you know, somebody being into it for like five bucks. But I mean, it's 12, no, 13 bucks full price. It's on sale right now for 20% off, which makes it. Ten dollars and thirty nine cents. Yeah, it still sounds and I like think a that's bit much. too much for this. It's it's too much for this. I think. I mean, it's your money. You know, you the listener, you can spend it on whatever you want. I don't feel like that you'd get ten dollars worth out of this game, but two, three, maybe even five dollars, definitely worth it at that point. Um, but you know, it's it's not bad. It's a solid like C plus to B minus game, like above average. Definitely some fun some fun to be had in it, potentially a good podcast or, or, or audiobook game. Or if you've got uh, a really shitty like laptop or something and you're going on like a, a business trip or to go visit your in-laws or something like that, you know, this, this would be a game that could help soak up some time and provide some enjoyment on something like that. Um, so, you know, I, I think there are better games for that, but depending on what type of genre, genre you're into, you might not be into like Factorio or Terraria or something like that. Um, and this could be something that might uh, might flip your switch. Might rev your engine. Get you going. Might tote so, your galerons. It might. It might do that. Um, so yeah, that's Sky of Destruction. The other game I played this week is Endless World. This game is a hot piece of fucking garbage. Um, it yeah, is I a find free... it funny that you really like the game that's mixed reviews but you think the one that's mostly positive is hot garbage this is a uh an idle rpg type game um and the thing that sets this one apart from other ones that i have played is that this is like a fully 3d animated idle game um and it the screen looks sort of like uh the on screen it looks sort of like an mmo when you play it though there's an action bar um different icons and an inventory window. If it's and, an auto game, is it an action bar? Ah, nice. Um, and things like that. Um, it's got, it definitely got some good kind of tongue in cheek humor to it. That's fun. Um, 
And as far as these idle type games go, like it's fine in that respect. Like if you've played one idle game, you've played all the idle games basically, and they just have different themes to them or different ways that you sort of build up that maximum sort of meter or damage or combo or whatever you're playing. All of that's fine. Where it's a piece of hot fucking garbage is I'm pretty, pretty positive that this is just a really shitty ass mobile port. It doesn't run at 30 frames a second. You can't pull it out of windowed mode into full screen. Like, you can click the full screen button, but all it does is it stretches it out at whatever shitty, tiny resolution it's actually playing at. So it looks like a stretched, gross mess. Um, it's doesn't... It's just, it's just a mess. It crashes regularly. It didn't just crash the desktop either. It completely crashed my computer wow. twice. Yeah, that takes talent. And then it it crashed the desktop two or three times. And then it crashed uh, my my sc- instead of having a blue screen of death, I had like a brown screen of death. Well, that really like, is shit. Weird. Did my whole computer crash? And I, I gave it a second. And I tried like you know Control Alt Delete or you know Alt F four and a few other things, and nothing happened. So I restart my PC. I was like, I don't know if this is the game or if I encountered some other weird error, so let's just try it one more time. And then it did it a second time. Although this time it was more of an ar- orange, orangish brown instead of just like straight brown. So I was like, okay, fuck it. That's it. I'm uninstalling after after that happened. You, I mean, you can do you can be a little bit more interactive with it than you can some other games. You can click the enemies for extra damage. You can click around on the map to find like hidden gold and gems and other items and upgrades it does have a full inventory uh or sorry full equipment uh menu kind of like an mmo with with different weapons and armor pieces and things like that like i i feel like they tried to take um kind of a generic fantasy mmo throw some tongue-in-cheek humor in there and then turn it into one of these idle style games which is fine and i probably would think it was purely average if it didn't look and run like fucking garbage and crash constantly. I played it for less than an hour and I had something like six crashes with two of them being my whole PC crashed and had to be manually restarted. So fucking terrible. Stay away. Utter hot garbage. It might be all right on mobile. If there's a mobile version, I actually haven't checked. Uh, I don't see anything about mobile version. Okay. Okay. Well, then whoever created this game it doesn't know how to code or program shit. I don't know. It sounds like they successfully crushed your computer a couple of times. That takes talent. Or they like did. It takes a special kind of talent. So, yeah. If it wasn't for the fact that it had crashed so many times, I might have not even talked about it. But because it crashed so many times, I want to warn you to stay away from this trash fire. So, that is Endless World. Avoid like the plague. Let's just put it this way. I do not see anything about a mobile version. And they only have one other game, which is Radiant Crusade. Which, yeah, let's go take a peek at that on Steam. Well, let's just put it this way. Five reviews. It looks like it's a... What the fuck is that? I mean, seriously, what the hell? It, 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 go, go look at this, Jared. It, it, okay. uh, some of the screenshots look like they're... Uh, you know the 3D effects uh, for red and blue glasses? It looks like they're trying to pull that off, but they have the colors wrong. Uh, Radiant Crusade. Yeah, I actually have this. I think I got this as a review code back in the day. Oh. That does not look good, does it? That hurts my eyes. A couple of those screenshots. Oh, and the little, I, I little pit, gif. Yeah, I pity anyone that plays this in VR mode. Yeah. If it wasn't for that, I mean, it, would, it didn't, wouldn't look too terrible. It would look very basic. Like just kind of a generic, yeah, kind of a generic, basic, driving uh, but, car combat. Yeah, but for some reason, it's uh, uh, in the ocean. I think they're trying to do that effect because they're underwater. I think that's probably the idea, but it looks bad and it hurts my eyes. It looks bad and they should feel bad. They should. So, who who are you? Game Radiance Games. 
Fuck off. <laughs> oh, wow. Uh, what, did they prank you or something? <laughs> Your game fucking sucks. You suck dick. That's maybe a little, little harsh. I'm apparently sassy all of a sudden. That's probably a little harsh, but yeah, it's like they this world it's sucks. like they pulled some sort of prank on you or something. I mean, you're usually not this harsh. It's just a prank, bro. It's just uh, a prank. You, usually, I'm the harsh one. Yeah, stay away. So that's all the games we played this week. So, do you want to go do the news? Uh, yeah, let's go do the news. No, 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 no. Let's wait a half an hour. Sure, let's go. Okay. <laughs> Uh, our first news topic of the night, Modern Warfare Special Ops Survival Mode is available only on PS4 for one year. Well, that's one way to kill a mode on every other uh, game system, huh? Yeah. Uh, this is... Well, okay. Why don't they just call a spade a spade here? The survival mode is exclusive to the uh, to the PlayStation 4. Because this is a Call of Duty game, and what's a Call of Duty game, if anything? An annual release. Mm-hmm. So a year exclusivity on a game that moves its player base somehow, don't ask me how, from release to release on a yearly basis. By the time this is on Xbox, by the time I'm assuming this will end up on PC, maybe, because who knows, right? Right, they don't. Uh, uh, they'll already ha- either have moved on to the next Call of Duty title, or the pre-release hype will be in full swing, and whatever the next Call of Duty game will be, uh, uh, will be yeah, you know, you know, the focus of will be on that, and this game will drop off. Except for the hardcore audience that likes yep you know, something about this particular title. I wonder if they'll have a reversal too, and the next exclusive will be on Xbox One. Well, it depends on how much Microsoft is willing to pay now. <laughs> That's true. That's true. I mean, ex- there are the only thing that I am in favor for for exclusives is when it comes to in-house first-party content. Like you want to have yeah. a selling point for your specific console. Yeah, and while a loss I wish leader, it would be on all the things. Yeah. Well, yeah. I wish it would be on all the things. I totally understand if you, as a console developer, create your own games. You want to keep those exclusively to your platform. I can understand that and accept it. But when it comes to stuff like this, it's not its not good. It's not pro-consumer. It's not anything except shitty. And it fuels... And I mean, I know why they do it. It's a psychological thing. It fuels that whole, you know, sort of air quotes, console war sort of well, thing. Well, I was going to say that... People talking you know, and bitching uh, and... The uh, missing out syndrome, you know. Yeah. FOMO. The FOMO. Fear of missing yeah, out. Yeah, the fear of missing out. Sorry, I, I, I was blanking on the... Uh, an acronym for it. The fear of missing out the, you know, well, I have to get this on PlayStation because otherwise I may actually like the survival mode. Who knows if the survival mode, survival mode is going to be any good or any fun to play. You know, the only way I'm going to get the complete experience. And let's be honest, even if you buy it on PlayStation four and buy the, you know, the collector's edition or whatever the hell they call it, it won't be the complete experience because they'll have all the microtransactions on top of it. Because of course they will, right? Of course they will. You're That's still for the you're, now. you're still going to be missing out on that particular game mode if you're not playing on PlayStation. Never mind the fact that yeah, playing a first person shooter on a console is a terrible idea to begin with because yeah, yeah, uh, random clunky controls. PC Master Race. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's just what the hell, right? Yeah, I mean, I I hate that this is the norm. I really do. Yeah, and the fact that this is uh, infected PC as well by going, you know, Epic Game Store versus Steam versus GOG versus everything else. Yeah. And again, I'm okay with competing platforms, and I'm okay with platform holders having exclusives to their own platform. I wish that it was, you know, otherwise, but I can understand that. But Mm -hmm. this whole thing like this is all bullshit. I'm wondering if, so recently, um, there has been a, a trend, a, a rising trend in uh, mobile phones, not like apps, but actual phone sales and a few other electronic de- devices that a couple of tech tubers uh, I follow have talked about, how the different regions get the different 
upgrade. So it, they still have releases on a yearly cycle. And if you want to import one of these things from another region, you can. But in order to try and still maintain that sort of hype machine, but also spread out the actual number of releases and upgrades they have to do, they're releasing different upgrades in different regions. Yeah, for so, well, for example, my phone, uh, the G5 version of it, I think it's still only available in Asia. Mm-hmm. Uh, to be fair, you know, the US G5 hasn't exactly you know, been established yet, so unless you're in a major city... Or sorry, 5G. When you say G5, 5G, G, sorry. Okay, I was going to say, do you uh, mean 5G? Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Uh, 5G hasn't really been established in the U.S. yet, so the 5G version of my Galaxy S10 you know, doesn't really make a lot of sense, but you know, there's that fear of missing out. You know, i got to have the best. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering if that's going to, what they're doing now is going to somehow evolve into that they use exclusive modes or some kind of exclusive content as a way to sort of step back from the yearly release cycle on brand new titles, especially as the gaming industry still plows headfirst into disaster that is live service gaming for everything. Yeah. As a way to sort of pad out the, the content releases and still keep the hype up, but not have to develop a brand new game every year or two years. Yeah. I mean, Ubisoft has gone full on in that one uh you know live service <laughs> gaming uh there was actually a, a jim sternley did a video on uh the latest uh tom clancy wildlands or uh, yeah the latest tom clancy game from them that's just actual absolutely baggedy with uh microtransactions where it's 500 some dollars at launch and they're selling power yeah i saw that video earlier today or maybe yesterday, whenever it released. Yeah, it's just it, um, the AAA gaming industry is just getting absolutely ridiculous to begin with, and that's even before we start talking about exclusivities. Before we start talking about all the gambling mechanics that's being put into games, where before we're talking about all the uh, essentially psychological warfare, uh, the uh, pandering to children to try to drain their parents' bank accounts. It's just obscene. Yeah. There's a reason why I've been playing more indie games. There's a reason I've been playing more on the Xbox Game Pass. Yeah, I was going to say, we've had this conversation before in the past, but how that you especially and me becoming more so a a patient gamer, someone who waits until a year or two or longer after release. Yeah, I got enough enough of a a backlog. I could go play something else. Or now with the Game Pass, you know, I'm going to have a few games on release I could go play. Yeah, Game Pass is fucking awesome. And they're still running plenty of deals on it. So, you know, a, a couple of three weeks ago, we we each got like a free uh, I, month. Yeah, a free it month. It was two free yeah, months, actually, yeah, if you free. signed up for automatic payment, even if you were already signed up for automatic payment, which mm-hmm. I was. So two months that way. And then I saw it on my Xbox console on the dashboard. You could pay $2 and get two additional months yeah, of their uh, Game Pass Pro. But that includes the PC Game Pass. So I'm paid up through January uh, for $4. Yeah, I just wonder, uh, I just hope that they uh, continue being such a good deal. Because right now, I would say they're the best ga- uh, the, de- the best deal in gaming right now. Because what used yeah. to be the best deal was Twitch Prime, which their latest bundle of games is out. And kind of terrible, got to be honest. I haven't even looked yet. Uh, mostly horror games. I guess it games. is October 1st, though. So, yeah. Oh, that makes sense, since it's October, but uh, I'm not a big yeah. horror guy. Um, But yeah, being a patient gamer is a really good way, probably the best way to game right now, unless you just have lots and lots of disposable income. Or you have I mean, a group of friends that have to play the latest to greatest. Yeah. Because if you could wait even just six months, you're going to see a huge discount, especially on PC where it goes to the uh, either the summer or winter sales. You're going to see, uh, honestly, buying a game on release, especially a AAA title right now, is a very risky thing just because of how absolutely buggy games are, because of how broken games are. Sometimes just how much the marketing has been lying. 
So it's tough to even say wait for the initial reviews. I would say wait for the second or third wave of reviews. I mean, Thou Shall Not Pre-Order is still a thing, but it's starting to really look Thou Shall Not Bound Day 1. Yeah, it's much harder to recommend doing that. Um, you know, there's there's still some games that do well and still games that have more minor issues instead of major ones or being massively unfinished, but, you know, it, it becomes harder and harder to say, hey, buy this brand new game. Yeah, especially, you know, five bucks and, you know, you get access to a bunch of games. Uh, go to Humble Bundle. They usually have at least one or two good game bundles going on. Uh, if you're an Amazon Prime user, go to uh, Twitch Prime and start picking up your games there. For Well, they're not technically free because you are paying a subscription, but, you know, you know your additional content. There's just so much more that you could do outside of paying $60 for a maybe good game. If, you know, uh, that's the other thing is if it gets patched, if it gets supported, because even a AAA company, let's pick one almost at random, Squaresoft or Square Enix on PC, they're abysmal. They do not uh, support their games. They do not patch their games very much. So if there's a game-breaking bug, you may have to try to figure out workarounds for it. And most people do not know about this. So they'll buy, you know, the the latest Final Fantasy port or uh, the bad one is Nier Automata. So... Nier Automata? Nier Automata. I've also heard Nier Automata. I don't know. Nier Automata (laughs) P. Uh... And there's never been a patch for that, and there's been some severe bugs with that game. But it's been rave reviewed because of its themes, of its gameplay. But if you're someone that cannot stand a buggy release, well, you're out of luck if you want to play it on PC. Indeed. I think you and I have similar but slightly different views on that respect, just because of where we are in terms of, like, where, because you've had a shift recently in your sort of hobbies. Mm-hmm. I don't know if if you'd still consider like if you consider gaming or cooking to be a bigger hobby. Uh, I think it um, depends on my mood because uh, there's been a couple times I've uh, you know got fed up with a game and I went and baked something. Uh, I went yeah. and beat the ever living hill out of two pounds of dough. And then there's a, a difference in the amount of disposable income that we have. Mm-hmm. And so while I, I think for the most part, it's probably easier for me to be like, yeah, fuck it. I'll try this. Not everyone is in that boat. And even if you are kind of in that boat, even if you've got one or two sort of new games worth of disposable income a year, you still want to try and make sure that they're going to be the most well spent. And I just can't really justify buying new games all that often anymore. And I have a... Between Steam sales and Game Pass and... Um, how many options there are out there for bundles or free games and things like that. It's just, I have a hard time committing nowadays. And I just have a psychotic hatred for how the marketing has played up uh, games and has said, oh, it's okay if it's buggy or at least we can fix it later. Yeah. I do think there's some value in being able to go back and correct things, but whenever you just sort of rely on that as a band-aid, like, ah, fuck it, push it out the door, we'll fix it later. Like, that is the wrong attitude to have. Yeah, but so many companies, particularly AAA companies, have that. Well, AAA companies have. <laughs> Thank that. you, Jim Sterling. I, I also did air quotes. <laughs> uh, oh. uh, we can't see you, thankfully. <laughs> audio podcast. This is an audio only podcast. Thankfully. All righty. Uh, Let's. Yeah, move speaking on. of bad attitudes, right? Yeah. Mario Kart Tour Gold Pass costs more than Nintendo Switch Online and other services. Oh, Nintendo, 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 Nintendo. Ugh. What is going on with them with mobile gaming? It's like they, it's like they, they had, they dipped their toe in the water with Mario Run or uh, their Mario Runner and it didn't pan out as well as it, uh, as they hoped. 
So they just chugged all the bad gaming practices all at once. Yeah. So I have seen and heard some things, some, I think this was on one of Jim Sterling's recent Jimquisitions. And I honestly can't remember if he said if it was like a rumor or if there was an article that had floated around about some devs who were talking, but essentially Nintendo views like Nintendo proper, Nintendo home based, Nintendo Japan. I don't know exactly the right way to classify that entity sees mobile gaming more of an advertising tool for their core game element for their actual consoles um, and their sort of mainline games. And that's fair and fine and dandy, but they have sort of adopted all of these principles and they have brought on all of these other mobile devs instead of developing stuff in house. And they've chugged the Kool-Aid big time. Yeah. I mean, they just stuck their head in the punch bowl here. And so you wind up with a below average, I, I think it comes off way more below average as well because of all of this bullshit Mario Kart game on mobile that has got a really shitty uh, game pass or uh, uh, well, season well, pass. Well, thing. well, let's talk about th- this first. I, if this is Mario Kart in name only. I played the beta. I've played Mario Kart. This does not feel like Mario Kart. This feels like a game that is ripping off Mario Kart. So you are essentially just steering your, uh, and occasionally you'll get a power up, but there's none of the shortcuts, at least in the beta version I played. There's none of the, you know, charm that Mario Kart had. It's, it's wearing its skin suit. All right. Mm-hmm. But, but the soul wasn't there. You know, it's dead eyes staring at you. And right. it may just be my intense like uh, uh, dislike of gotcha mechanics to begin with, which you know, this has. But on top of that, now it has a $5 a month subscription service. Yep. If you want to get the 200 CC races, what? which are the fastest races, yeah. which you can just play in any of the Mario Kart games on console. Um, <laughs> Gold gifts for racing. Uh, tours. Essentially, it's extra loot and then special in game badges earned by completing gold challenges. What the hell, right? Yeah, I think. I think that this would be. Okay, so if this was just a free mobile Mario Kart and maybe they made it more, a little more cheaply, they had fewer uh, characters, fewer carts, fewer tracks, things like that, it was just completely free. None of these mechanics and everything else being exactly the same, it would probably be like a great... Everyone would probably be like, yeah, this is a great little mobile version of Mario Kart. It's not as good as the real thing, but like if I'm away from home, I'm on the toilet, I want to play some Mario Kart, I can whip it out and I can play a race or two. People would probably love it. And then they, you know, then they could go home and they could play Mario Kart. Or if you introduce somebody to it this way, then you could get them into the actual environment. Like, I feel like if that was the case... This would be a completely different story, and people would be praising the cute, cheap, simple little Mario Kart that they released on mobile devices. And I feel like that would stick with what Nintendo has stated about their view being on mobile games. But then you take that, and then shove it full of gotcha mechanics, and then it just becomes an insult to anyone who has ever played Mario Kart on a Nintendo console ever. Yeah, it's just... It's astonishing that, that Nintendo it cares this little about their IP on mobile whenever they've gone absolutely absurdly insane on YouTube. Remember, they uh, set up uh, uh, their partner program on there, and if you weren't part of that, you literally could not do anything with Nintendo and have it monetized because... You are hurting their brand. I mean, that's the that's the insane thing is that they've gone so crazy trying to protect their brand, and then they just throw out mobile games that are uh, just complete garbage. But on the flip side, there's also reports that uh, that this game is breaking records all over the place. So maybe we're old. Maybe I'm old. Yeah, I just don't know. I have no idea. Part of me, part of all of this makes me think that Nintendo hasn't quite grasped the idea of what mobile games are in the market today. But then you see, like, how it's like 
extremely popular and all this other stuff. And so I'm thinking, well, maybe they do get it. I'm, I'm getting, you know, I have mixed feelings about so it. It's not, we're not wrong. It's the children who are wrong. <laughs> I mean, I'm willing to bet that it's in the top three right now on Google Play. Let's see. Google Play. Wait for it. Apps. Top chart. It is a, uh, b- 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 uh, top three games. Number one. How about that? There you go. But then again, here's the thing is that number one is Mario Kart Tour. Number two is Appeal Good, which is a simulator for peeling fruit and vegetables. Oh, <laughs> uh, okay. Sure. I mean, that's a thing, right? Why not? I've seen weirder things. And then number three is Dinosaur Rampage, which actually I've seen a bunch of ads for this. I think I've. Th- this had an ad, like I... a major ad campaign on Facebook. I'm going to look because right this now. Looks, I'm this sure. looks very familiar. Pretty sure I saw this on Facebook at one point. Yeah. I have a. One of the people that I work with plays this. We were talking about games, me and another coworker. Yeah, I'm a gamer. He like, <laughs> right? He was like, I play he was like, I play a few games on mobile. I was like, Oh, what do you play? And this was one of them. And and one my the other coworker was like making fun of him and I was like, No, nah, it's okay. Not everybody has to play PC or console games. Like you can play mobile games and enjoy it. He's like, Oh thanks, man. Most people make fun of me. I'm like, I'm not gonna gatekeep you person who I'm not going to say your name. I mean, let's put it this way. Super Mario Run is still in the top 25. So, yeah, they haven't exactly done poorly, but the thing is that they tried to sell a you know, a $10 uh, in, uh, infinite, run, uh, infinite Runner. So that's a little bit much to bite off, even though it is Mario, right? Yeah. Some of that, though, is is definitely because it's Mario, I think. Mm -hmm. You know, almost like paying the, for the, you know, paying for the name. Yeah. Oh, you're... Gotta pay your tax. Well, you're telling an Android user that. Yeah, I know. But that was the first analogy that popped into my head. Hey, but uh, the next iPhone may have an Apple logo that blinks to tell you uh, uh, notifications. I saw that patent floating around. Holy fuck! Jumping ship immediately to a shittier device just because of a blinking apple. Well, to be fair, my phone doesn't have a, a LED on it to, for notifications. That's my major pet peeve with this one. Like, as part of the design, it doesn't have... No, it doesn't have an LED. That's interesting. What's your notification? F- uh, like, how do you get a notification? Like, obviously, it would vibrate or make uh, noise, no, it, but after that... Uh, there is an option uh, if the screen is on. For around the, well, the selfie cam, the peekaboo cam, or whatever you want to call it, uh, uh-huh. to have a glowing ring around it. Uh, but that's the LED or the LCD lighting up. Hmm. That's interesting. But basically, I, my f- I have my phone set up. Well, when it's not on silent like it is right now, very important. Uh, uh, people uh, messaging me. I have a unique identifier. Uh, a, de- a unique uh, sound effect for their text messages and different apps have different sound effects so if I'm talking to someone uh, like uh, on uh, Facebook if someone messages me on there there's like two people that messages to me so I know it's one of two people most likely gotcha my phone because it's got the curved screen will do the edge thing if it's laying like face down, oh, the oh, edge mine has a curved will... screen as well, but the case actually protects the sides. Yeah, my case shows the sides. I mean, I never put my phone face down, so I like have disabled that feature. But if it's laying face down, the edge will light up, and then it will. I, I've also got this disabled because my phone all just has an an LED, but it, the screen will pulse. It'll it'll it's got just this little graphic, and it looks like the screen is pulsing, almost like water is being dropped on it whenever I have messages, mm-hmm. and it will pulse different colors based on what the messages are. Yeah, see, uh, and that's pretty yeah, neat, but st- it chews up battery. Yeah, mine will uh, 
Uh, if it does trigger it, because it, depending on the app, it may or may not. I'll just do a lighted ring around the uh, camera, so it's not turning on that much of the uh, screen. Everything else is staying dark. Gotcha. So, you know, it's not eating up that much battery, but uh, if it's in the pocket, you know, it doesn't do that. Gotcha. So, so welcome, how about that, Mario Kart? So, so welcome to the mobile phone portion of the podcast. Indeed. So, yeah, just to sort of swing back around and at least for what I have to say, wrap it up. I'm not gonna gonna play this game. I'm not interested. I'm just gonna stick to playing my airline management game until I get tired of that, and then I'll find something else to uh, play. Something else to get a sick obsession about. Indeed. Oh god, I just had a thought. I had a thought. I'm gonna have to share this. They're air morphs in your mind, aren't they? No, but they are now. Thank you, thank you for that. <laughs> Now I'm going to be sitting in my office with a huge erection thinking of aeromorphs. And I'm sorry for anybody that looks up that word. Uh, You're welcome to anyone who looks up that word. No, do not. Do not do it. Airplanes. airplane porn. Airplanes aren't supposed to be that sexy. Anthropomorphized airplane porn is what that is. You're welcome. Yeah, and I... Also, I saved you a Google search. Yeah, and I blame Jared for uh, introducing me to that term. Yes, indeed. It, it that one was all my fault. No arguments there. Uh, let, let's face it; it's always your fault. It's just this time it actually is your fault. It's actually been a little a little while since I've looked up any aeromorph pictures. Oh uh, well, I know what you're doing while you're editing the podcast now. Indeed. So moving on to our final news topic of the night. Let me pull this back up. Rocket League replaces loot crates with loot br- blueprints. Blueprints. <laughs> loot blueprints. Uh, was it Scooby? <laughs> yeah, Rocket League replaces loot crates with loot b- blueprints. I, st- I still almost fucked it up. I mean, let's be perfectly honest here. This is essentially loot crates without the randomization uh, model. It's just you know, what's already been generated by the loot crate or what would have been generated. But this is taking the random or the slot machine mechanic out so step in the right direction maybe i mean i'm still not a fan of the uh, of these systems especially you know on you know paid games but it's at least it's less shitty but yeah Yeah. but if i'm trying to pick a less shitty option you know this isn't a an election you know i'm not casting my ballot here no if if someone put a gun to my head and said loot boxes or Rocket League system, new system, I'd pick the Rocket League system. But, you know, I'm also almost just as likely to say shoot me. <laughs> Especially with how gaming has gone these days. Is there is yeah. there any surprise that I've been cooking more and going more down that rabbit hole? No. <laughs> um, but yeah, so like you said, I mean, it's basically loot boxes where it's already sort of done the role. And shows you what you would get. And yes, it is a, a little less bad, but it's still uh, weird unlocked randomized drops. Or, or weird pay to unlock pre-randomized drops. I just, I still don't see the appeal. Like on the one hand, it's like, okay, if it's something that I want, I can, you know, use my credits or um, to unlock it. Which is what the new premium currency is, is just credits. Um, you could do that. But if I'm going to just spend money on something that I could see, I'd rather just be able to have like a full out cosmetics or microtransaction type shop, which Rocket League already has is, in the again, DLC. Yeah, so no thank you. <laughs> I mean, I haven't played Rocket League in a while. We played uh, as a, a, a group last year sometime yeah, well, was the last time we yeah, played. Well, it was much whenever w- my computer blew up. Yeah. <laughs> that was the last time yeah, we played. Yeah, that's what it died, wasn't it? It's like, uh, no, fuck this. Yeah, that's when my power supply died. We were playing Rocket League, and in the middle of a match, it it died, and I thought my power had went out, and then I smelled burning. Yeah, uh, usually when you smell burning, that's bad. Um, usually, yes. Uh, But, 
pretty much as soon as Epic announced that they bought uh, Rocket League or the developer, yeah, I just uninstalled and you know forgot about it because I, let's face it, it's going to end up uh, Epic Store exclusive like Dauntless. So I just have no patience for it. I, I I find myself frustrated by it more often than not, just because a lot of the player base have no life the game for the last what three four years. Yeah, and you run into people online that are just absurdly good, and Rocket League is one of those games that's absolutely amazing to watch. Somebody that's been practicing for years now be able to pull off some absolutely insane stuff, but at the same time, it's very frustrating to play against them. Yeah. And I mean, we've tried playing with bots, and the bots are okay, but it's really inconsistent because of the different levels uh, that we are, the different sort of skill levels that we all are. Yeah, like, and so it's hard. me and you are actually somewhat close. You're a little bit better in... uh, uh, off the uh, in the air, while I'm a little bit better in positioning, I think. I think that's about fair, right? Yeah, I'd say so. And then uh, Ghost and Kyle are, if I remember correctly, about the same. Spaceman too. Yeah, and if we have Nels then... in the underwater arena, just forget about her. Yeah, she's going to sit there and look at the whale. Yeah, and then f- I think it's Phil is probably the best out of all yeah. of us. Like. He kicked our asses that one or two times he played uh-huh. with us. And then, yeah. And so it's like it's really hard to create balanced teams with us. And then bots, it's impossible to create a balanced team also. So it's it's just hard to play together. Plus, playing with randos is insane. Yeah, it, because like you said, a huge chunk of the player base is really fucking good. And this is a game that has a very low skill floor but an insanely high skill ceiling. Yeah, and it just it always frustrated me to be able to you know to be able to put in the time to get good because I'm just sitting here thinking, okay, I'm getting my ass handed to me. I have so many other games I could be playing that would be more fun. So yo, know, I just uninstalled it. Yeah, and maybe that's a failure on my part. I don't know. I think I still have it installed, but I mean, I haven't touched it since, like I said, the, whenever it was the last time we played it and my computer blew up was the last time that I've touched it. And that was months and months ago. Maybe at the beginning of this year, February-ish, maybe March. That's something like that. Um, so, yep. Sad day. I mean, it's a step. I mean, it is a step forward. Let's, don't get me wrong here. It is a step forward. It's a movement away from abysmal loot crates, and it's not just a battle pass. Even though, hey, uh, uh, Rocket League also has a season pass, and they charge you if you want to get you know, on the good path to get all the good stuff because the free pass it starts off okay, then it starts to really peter out after just a few uh, levels. And once again, you know, yeah, it just has a lot of a grind, which I realize Rocket League is a sports game at the end of the day. And a sports game is about imp- spending time to improve on it and uh, build your skill and to grind on it. And Rocket League for me oh, is a cur- yeah, it, grind on it. It is a curiosity. It's something if you know, I catch the pro level players on Twitch playing it, I'll sit and watch them because you know, that is absolutely insane to watch. But at the end of the day, I just don't have a lot of fun playing it. So maybe my personal bias against how I've kind of gotten frustrated with Rocket League is also coming into this. Whenever this is a step forward, this is another step away from loot boxes, even though They've been, you know, kind of a bane in uh, AAA, well, in gaming for quite a while now. And Rocket League was a somewhat early adopter of them. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. It is a little bit of an improvement, but it's still, you know, not great. And I'm, I think I still like Rocket League a bit more than you did, but I'm, I don't know. I'm not going to say I'll never go back and play it. But we just don't really have the friend group that wants to play it regular. 
at least not typically i don't think i don't ever i don't see people in discord saying hey anybody want to play rocket league yeah yeah which honestly can't blame them because yeah wherever we played online we've gotten stomped and whenever we uh try to play in groups yeah yeah we usually end up with uh, yeah the same teams uh you know winning out you know yeah and it's just been a thing where yeah we have a very imbalanced uh you know group of friends uh playing it and we don't have enough of a core group to be able to play online and do well and the bots are there for practice let's be honest yeah so ready to move on to the final portions of the show uh yeah let's move on sweet so for community corner this week we did not have any emails do we have any tweets no uh no the bird's still dead (laughs) so community game night i need to pull up the pins oops i'm on the wrong thing need to see what the list says is up next and probably adjust it because we did Warframe two weeks in a row. Yeah, which, yo, know, we were the only ones that played it, so that you was know, kind of a bad community night, to be honest. Uh, it's Cards Against Humanity. Yep. So next week we will be playing Cards Against Humanity. I'm not sure if we're going to do tabletop and actually use Cards Against Humanity or use the uh, pre- what pre- is pre- it, like y- XX, YY, yeah, pre- pre- pretend or whatever. Z or something. Yeah. Uh, we'll be playing. Yeah, I, I think that one's the easier one because it's all self contained on our website. Yeah, well, that's probably how we'll do it. So we'll play cards yeah, against humanity. It's a lot cleaner. <laughs> well, as clean as cards against humanity. Air quotes, be. cleaner. Yeah. But with the bigger, blacker dick, right? The biggest, blackest dick. So, after that on the list, we have got DEF CON. Um, yeah, which. For the- uh, I may just skip out and, uh, you know, uh, prepare for the. Oh, no, Card Against Humanity will be uh, that week. Right, we'll see if I catch Con Crowd. That's the that's so the other just, thing. Because yeah, I have I I've just, got I got my flu shot a week ago. I should be at full immunity from it uh, next week for the con. But you know, there's all sorts of strange illnesses. Plus, there's the furries. So who knows what they're carrying, right? Yay, furries! So I I, I just adjusted the list down because we had to. Wound up canceling one week in there somewhere. Um, so the 7th, that's October 7th, will be Cards Against Humanity. October 14th will be DEF CON. Um, and then we don't have any more games on the list. So as always, if you have ideas or suggestions to put games on the list, please let me Are know. Are we before but choosing? Have, yeah. If you have let me know before and I have just forgotten to put them on, please remind me because obviously I forgot. And if I don't hear anything from anybody by, yeah, we have, I'll say Monday. Yeah, we have nine slots to fill. Yeah, if I don't hear anything from anybody by Monday, uh, October the 7th, I will, or maybe me and you, will go through and just throw some games up there for the next few weeks and continue on our merry What way. frame it is? <laughs> Possibly. Or Forza some more or something, I don't know. A uh, community anime night. That would work. I mean, you guys are more than welcome to make other suggestions that aren't just video games. If you want to watch movies or something, just as long as it's something that either is available that we all can watch. Uh, I don't know if everyone has Netflix. I feel like that one's pretty standard. But if you have a ripped version, we can post it. Uh, uh, I'll well, link to it in Discord. Oh, the thing is, uh, there's a new way. site, uh, Rapid, closed down the uh, this uh, stream synchronization site. Yeah, uh, but there's a new one that's popping up uh, that should be active in the next couple of weeks. So I'll be able to go check that out and see if that will be an option for like a community like movie night or something. Okay, sounds good. Um, so my brain uh, just like <laughs> fell out of my ear. <laughs> Where, how, how, and where can they contact us, Rach? Well, you can contact us, contact us, vglpodcast at gmail.com, or just, hey, wake up that dead bird. It's just sleeping, I swear. Over at vglpodcast on the Twitter. So, 
with that, let's head on over and do a discovery queue and go for the theme song. And I have something immediately because I had my queue open and I had something very interesting pop up on the first poll because I always do, it seems. Dodia. Dodia is a magical action roguelite set in a world where every pixel is physically simulated. Fight, explore, melt, burn, freeze, and evaporate your way through a procedurally generated world using spells you create yourself. This looks fucking amazing. This is... I would actually call this Metroidvania roguelite with a bit of magicka thrown in. Plus, uh, you know, a physics engine. It, I'm just watching the trailer and it's rather impressive. It feels like Almost some of the uh, mid late nineties uh, platformers, where they started mm-hmm. to be a little bit more creative and go for a more physical esque uh, world. Only this is also procedurally generated and it looks like it has a yeah the magica esque bit of humor to it. So yeah absolutely amazing looking and it looks like it's already pretty solid even though it is an early access uh they are expecting to stay in early access for a year and it is a bit pricey but eh, it is a pretty unique game so maybe that is you know, worthwhile in the end uh, oh it's from the creators of crayon physics deluxe so that's where yeah, this is kind of feeling familiar with the uh, uh, actual physics uh, portion of it. Mm-hmm. Okay, okay, that makes a lot more it sense. It does look now. very cool. That is awesome looking, huh? Yeah. So I got one. Um, Dragon Ball Z Kakarot. Uh, so, I mean, there have been uh, several successful DBZ games over the last few years. What caught my eye on this one is this last little bit here. Uh, experience life in the Dragon Ball Z world as you fight, fish, eat, and train with Goku, <laughs> Gohan, Vegeta, and it's others. It's a life sim? So, yeah, so as you, as I scroll down, it's like, experience the story of Dragon Ball Z. Experience the iconic battles and scales unlike never before. Blah, blah, blah. And then down here, it's like, uh, relive the story uh, beyond epic battles where you fight, fish, eat, train, explore new areas and adventures as you advance through the story and form bonds with other heroes in Dragon Ball Z. And it says you can make friends and build relationships with a massive cast of Dragon Ball characters. So, <laughs> there's no, I don't see anything in here that looks like it would relate to that, except the... Marketing plot? Uh, looks like the driving lesson episode, uh, where Goku and Piccolo go learn how to drive a For car. For some reason, right? Yeah, but it looks like they're learning how to drive a car. And that car has a and face. It, it, also, yeah. also, Goku is Super Saiyan driving a car. I mean, that seems wrong somehow. It does. But, yeah. Goku, th- th- this looks like almost, uh, I wouldn't say uh, GTA, I would say Simpsons Hit and Run, just with the art style. S- sort of. It-, it reminds me of the Persona series, just like the way that it, some of this looks. Um, yeah. I don't know. I I, ha- I haven't played a Dragon Ball game in Hawa- in a while. I've skipped the last two or three because most of the time it's just like you go through the story beats of the show, uh, you know, again and again with upgraded graphics and maybe like a different fight system of some yeah, kind. Yeah, if you want to go through the so story beats, the just go few. watch Dragon Ball Bridged, right? Yeah, but I mean, I'm this looks like it could potentially catch my eye. With that whole uh, life sim, uh, assuming aspect. That it is a life sim and it's not just you know uh, like an open world game. Yeah. Well, the tags for it are action RPG, anime, story rich, open world. What? No psychological so, horror. No, no psychological Yet. horror. At least in the popular tags. But yeah, I'm gonna add that to my wish list, which is probably pointless. Uh, and and, and, keep an and, eye and on then that. it'll get lost in the uh, pile. So, I have Saigian Reign of the Old One. So, hey, how about some Lovecraft? K. 
Okay. Delve into a role-playing game of horror, loss, and madness set in the strange worlds of H.P. Lovecraft. Uh, Saigian Reign of the Old Ones offers a mix of rich role-playing, turn-based tactical combat, represented in an illustrative visual style. So, RPG Lovecraft. Already an interesting combination. It looks like it has some really strong world-building, but it is very, very buggy and... Uh, not very well balanced, so maybe it'll get fixed later on. It's something to keep an eye on. Uh, this looks like this is the developer's first game, but it is a well-seasoned publisher, so who knows what to expect from that. But I just wanted to throw that out there because it looked interesting. And hey, Lovecraft, right? Yeah. So I got one. Overland. Take care of a group of travelers on a post-apocalyptic road trip across the United States in this turn-based survival game. It's got a very cute art style, um, which is interesting to combine with a post-apocalyptic sort of survival type game. But, I mean, it looks like, you know, just sort of an isometric turn-based game where this, you're this having was, to deal with situations. This was highlighted at creatures. E3 like two or three years ago. Yeah, it just recently released September nineteenth. Yeah, yeah, I remember so, it went. Uh, it was in early access uh, when it released. Uh, uh, right, they, it was one of those out now of, yeah, announcements at E three like two or three years ago. So I'm a little surprised that it's just now seeing a full release. But eh. so a lot, it's got mixed reviews. Just quickly glancing at some of the reviews, it looks like a lot of people are saying that it's too hard. And that it's too much like an old school actual rogue, or it's too much like the old school rogue in terms of like there's no like meta progression, uh, very, no unlocks. Oh, uh, very unforgiving. That it's very unforgiving, you know. And I, and I could see someone not liking that, but you know that's more of a I think a design choice yeah. than a fault with the game, just based on what they're saying. Who knows? I haven't played it, but it looks neat. So, I got one. I need to drop it into the list. Uh, I'm on uh, number three on my polls. And, you know, once again, uh, you know, I, I think I'm the more forgiving one for interesting games. So, I got Encased, a sci-fi post-apocalyptic RPG. So, you know, there's a very uh, appropriate title, I guess. It has a very old-school Fallout feel, and they list it directly as a uh, 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 an inspirational source where it's an isometric RPG where you are going through and well, trying to explore a, uh, a wasteland, level up your character, join one of the forces in a ruined world in this new apocalyptic turn-based RPG. There's not a lot hinting at what the overarching story is, but then again, it is Yo, just released, I think. Yeah, da, da, da. Uh, well, okay, it was released the last week, the last Thursday, actually. So not a lot of reviews, uh, but no, it looks interesting at least. It could be, uh, it could be one of those, you know, little sleeper games of this particular genre because there's not a lot of sci-fi isometric R RPGs, uh, especially modern ones. Yeah, there's quite a few older ones, but mm -hmm. very few more modern ones. Yeah. It's not on Key Mailer. Sad day. Uh, I have to buy this one the old fashioned yeah. way. So, oh, never mind. It is on Key Mailer. Cool. Um, so, I got another one, though. Uh, this looks like garbage, but I feel like I need to point it out. Just because Stand it's out garbage? VR. <laughs> Just because it seems. Bullshit. Well, that's, well, that's definitely VR not Battle Royale. Yeah, that's definitely not hyping or, or you know aping on the uh, player unknown's battlegrounds logo. Not at all. That's totally not it. Yeah. So looking at this, it looks like they said, "What's the the popular Battle Royale games? Let's do all of them." So you've got the uh, the art style, air quotes art style, and the uh, sort of logo font and things. Well, is there even an art style for PUBG? It's basically just assets bought from the Unity store, isn't it? That's why I said art style. I guess you can't see me doing finger quotes. Audio podcast, audio Jared. Podcast. Audio podcast. I have to remember, it's an audio podcast. I did finger quotes. So, but yeah, so it looks like they took that 
and then they said uh, VR that's a big thing so they made it VR and then it says that you can uh, build drive do parkour fly make friends and eat so it's like a uh, Fortnite, PUBG, uh, and then some other like popular bullshit mechanics. Looks like there's an update where you can get a nuke now. So Fallout 76. I don't know why anybody would want to copy that, but this is just. Well, let's be honest. It, there's not even a player base for this to get a full match. I bet. Uh, especially since it's a VR title. Yeah. Die, learn, and improve to finally be the last man standing. This is Battle Royale. No, it's not. Well, it's... So, yeah, well, I, just well, I would say it's out. a Battle Royale, not a good one. Speaking of uh, potentially not a good out. one, but, uh, you know, this is interesting. Flotsam. This is a a very colorful, stylized, uh, almost uh, cel-shaded... Uh, Colony management game where you're essentially in Water World. Let's be perfectly honest here, and you're collect. Oh, I think you've done this, or you did a. No, you did a game similar to this. Uh, uh, yeah, in, I, uh, I did in, uh, in Discovery Q like two or three weeks ago, but I don't think it yeah, was this I was one. Say. You did uh, one that was a bit more realistically uh, uh, colored, but this uh, has some very mixed reviews. It's in early access. Yeah, I don't think you did this one. I think you did a different one. Okay. I think you did it's something very like, interesting like that Bowling there's C or something. It's interesting that there's two sort of Waterworld games out at the same time. Yeah, this looks like it's a little bit more developed, or at least it has some sort of more structure to it than the other one did, because the other one looked like it was just a pure building uh, uh, colony game. This looks like it has some sort of story to it as well or some sort of quest system built into it already. Even though it is still an early access and da, 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 da. let's see it is how long is it going to be in here for roughly a year so two, three years from now we'll see full release let's be honest here. I mean it's interesting to say the least. Yeah. So <laughs> Oh, no, wait, that's... Different. Okay, never mind. No, 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 it's the same. I got... I was on Keymailer looking for that game, and I got a, a key for Stellatum, which is made by the same people who made Sky of Destruction and Aircraft Evolution. So, I guess they like me, question mark? Well, just wait till they hear the podcast. That's three games I've gotten <laughs> from them recently. Anyways, back to my list. I got distracted. I haven't. I don't have another one yet. Okay. Well, I got uh, a, um, a JRPG. So I like those. ATR Razia Ever Darkness and a Secret Hideout. Uh, it's not out yet. It's coming out in three weeks. So it's by Koi Tenro. So yeah, a, a fairly well-known t- uh, developer. Uh, they have a lot of anime games out, so it has at least a decent chance of being somewhat good, w- with a chance of being pretty good, depending on just you know, how they handle it, because you know, developer history does not make a good game or a bad game. But it looks like it has some interesting level up mechanics and some sort of crafting system built into it. I'm not sure if this ties into an overarching storyline, if this is part of something else. But, yeah, looks pretty interesting. Let's see, advanced synthesis system and location points. The synthesis system in which players combine materials to create items. Also known as crafting. Right? Woo, crafting! No, no, it's synthesis. It's not definitely not crafting. So it looks like it's an open world game with... Uh, some sort of uh, ARPG esque, or sorry, uh, JRPG esque uh, storyline tied to it. Tired of boring village life. I'm oh, sorry, uh, the main character is Raza, an ordinary girl. No, she isn't. Let's be perfectly honest here. It's an anime game. She is not an ordinary girl. Tired of boring uh, village life. She escapes the village to gather uh, with her friends, sorry, with her good friends in a secret location to talk of, uh, of their dreams and plan thrilling adventures. One day, the determined Raza and company decide to head for the Forbidden Island across the shore. 
as their first exploration trip. Together with an alchemist and other friends they meet there, they have a summer adventure that they will never forget. And summer adventure is in sarcasm quotes. So, yeah, it's tough to really say what's going on with this game. I mean, it's a JRPG. It's interesting looking, but who knows what's going on. Uh, on to you. What do you got? Yeah, so I have Dron- Dronjin Dungeons of Ink and Paper. Um, it's a very old school looking dungeon crawler game. Yeah, th- yeah this looks everything like, looks hand drawn. This looks like uh, gaunt uh, or not gaunt? Uh, uh, damn it! Blanking on the name of the game. There was uh, there was an old eighties uh, esque uh, dungeon crawler that w- was recently revamped. Uh, that this looks a lot like, but not quite. And I'm blanking on it. Well, I don't. I mean, I have seen games that look like this before. I've never played any, and I'm not familiar. They're, they're with They're usually that was pretty... before my time. Uh, I'll, I'll, are you calling me old? Yeah, you're an old man. Get the fuck off my lawn. Uh, uh, <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> fuck you. Uh, but usually these uh, games are more puzzle oriented so yeah, it's going to be interesting to see if they continue that or not um, short gameplay sessions it looks like it's almost roguelike I'm watching the actual, yeah, yeah they're, they're called uh, a roguelite a roguelite so interesting very interesting yeah I'm watching one of the videos for it and it looks like Instead of unlocking a treasure chest, he just slices it with his sword, and it falls apart because I guess it's paper. I don't know, but then he's fighting creatures, and it doesn't seem to do that. Hmm. Oh, he saved a cat. He got some hero points. Cool. Um, I mean, it looks neat. I like. I you know I like the here recently the a few games that have been with these you know hand drawn art styles. I like that. It's definitely. Uh, maybe not unique anymore, but something a little bit different that you don't see regularly that helps a game stand out. So I like seeing it. Uh, so I got uh, one. Let me drop it into the list. There you go. Jared, wake up. You can't make me. Oh, You're not my dad. List of that attitude. So Monster Boy and the Cursed Kingdom. Uh, 2D uh, action uh, platformer uh, with a little bit of Metroidvania thrown into it. It has a very uh, colorful art style. It's uh, There's something about it that I'm, I can't quite put my finger on. It, it looks like a very almost chibi style. But there's something here that... Uh, it's reminded me of something that I can't quite uh, remember, you know? And that's bugging me. Yeah. You know what I'm talking about, though, looking at this? It looks familiar in some way. Yeah, I think so. Um, it's like it's the first game by can't... this developer. And... Oh. Oh, maybe that's why. This is from the same publisher that did Blossom Tales and the, Sl- the Sleeping King, which was essentially a... Legend of Zelda, or old school Legend of Zelda S game that has a sort of similar art style in the other world, or a similar like retro feel, which without being just pixel art. So maybe that's it. It's just yeah, you know, it's retro styled, but it's uh, uh, like an updated late '90s, uh, early 2000s platformer. Yeah, I was thinking more retro styled as opposed to something specific. Yeah, maybe it's just, you know, like, it's that familiar thing. So, yeah. So, you got something? Um, how, no, how many do you have? I left? have, I'm done I with have my five queue. remaining, and I can talk about another one immediately. Okay. So, Power Rangers, Go Battle for, for the Grid. So, Power Rangers is still a thing, it seems. Go, go, Power Rangers. And, well, it's a 2D pla- uh, 2D fighter, uh, Mortal Kombat-esque uh, fighting game. But it looks like they're bringing a lot of the old school stuff along with some of the new stuff. So it's sort of 
uh, the overarching Mighty Morphin Power Rangers uh, universe, which is a little weird to see some of the old stuff, like you know the original Power Rangers with the newer ones like, with it as well. We're seeing some of the old mm-hmm. vil- uh, villains that were a lot more goofy. So yeah, interesting, huh? But hey, uh, t- another two yeah. D fighter. So if you really want a two D fighter, well, that that's an option for one. So I went ahead and started a second queue. If you've got five left, all right. Uh, mind mind industry. Of course, you found a mining game. Of course, you did. So it's a it's a tower defense game that looks like it's borrowing from various uh, factory building games. Uh, it's open-ended tower defense game with a focus on resource management. So it looks like you have to gather your own resources and build towers and defend those areas. Looks like you have to set up conveyor systems. I think this this looks kind of Factorio light um, with a larger focus on the actual defense portion of your base. That is that is the way it looks to me. That is very interesting looking at it. Feels a little... yeah. Where it has that factorial level on it? It looks very. Uh, looks like it go. You could go very, very deep down the rabbit hole with it if you really wanted to. Mm-hmm. So, I'm getting nothing on my last few. I'm very tempted to start another one, but I know how that ends up. Really, uh, actually, hang on. Here, here's yep. something that looks interesting. Screw it. We'll do it. Is it, what, the last one? No, it's next to the last. Okay. So, A Legionary's Life. A life sim where you're a Roman soldier during the years of the Second Punic War. And beyond. So, that's something different. We don't really see a lot of games dive into Roman stuff. Uh, the only one I could really think of recently was Domica, which was a gladiatorial combat uh, in Roman times that I played I guess I should say I mean I'm not saying I'm the arbiter of all games actually by a long shot I'm not but it's interesting to see a life sim from it where you're trying to just live your life during the Punic Wars I mean it's it, you know an odd choice of games but it's you know it works right yeah. Uh, well, assuming that's any good, but it looks like it has some pretty decent reviews, but it doesn't have very many, so a very, very, very niche title. And it looks like I would, I would actually call this uh, like an overworld gro- world roguelike or roguelike. So yeah, very interesting. So uh, you got one? Nope, I got. F- I got five games that didn't support the English language, three games that were just like bullshit games that I don't talk about anymore because the joke is kind of worn off. So, uh, are, you, are you tired of your uh, slider puzzle titty games? Things. Yeah, I had the one that I talk about, or one that I did talk about, and then a couple of games that you had on your pull. So I'm through a second. <laughs> well, I'm on my last game, so don't bother, right? Okay. And I'm, and yeah. I'm seeing what this is. Uh. Screw it, we'll do this one. It looks weird. It looks interesting. What the hell, right? So, so, so right. you went through two. I went through one. So, the mm-hmm. Somian Files, or sorry, AI, the Somian Files. Uh, play as Detective Conry Date on a case of an elusive serial killer in this thrilling sci-fi murder mystery. And is he fighting a bear? <laughs> In that one screenshot? I'm going to look. I mean, that looks like a bear to me. Or a guy in a bear suit. In the near future Tokyo. Oh, well, there you go. That explains it, right? Uh, Detective Kame Date is on a, a case of a mysterious serial, serial killer. Date must investigate crime scenes as well as just dreams on a case. Oh, sorry. On the hunt for clues from the mind of... Uh, Tokyo Yukari, uh, Zero Escape Zero, uh, series director, with character design by Yusuke Kaskia. No more heroes in Fire Emblem series. Well, there you go, right? <laughs> and 
If you're yep. familiar with No More Heroes, that's a guy in a bear suit. And this thrilling yep. neo noir detective adventure about uh, that is about to unfold. So, yeah, that looks really interesting. It looks like it could get really weird. I mean, not Kojima weird, but weird, right? Yeah. I'm all for fighting a guy in a bear suit. Or or what about fighting a bear in a bear suit? Because we can't see his face. We're not sure. Bears all the way down. Bear on bear on bear violence. Yeah, but to, but to be fair, all you have to do is throw a, Coca, uh, a Coca-Cola at him and you know, a, par- a polar bear just ignores it. Uh, yeah, ignores you, right? Yeah. <laughs> and then Santa Claus comes. Yeah, two months early. It's not even December yet, Santa. I want a Coca-Cola. Eat your cookie and go back to the North Pole, North Pole, fat man. At least let us have Thanksgiving, right? Indeed. All right. So that was your last one? Yep, that was it for me. Sweet. Rage, why don't you hit him with them there socials? Well, I've been Caffeine Rage. You can find me on the YouTube's Game with Caffeine Rage. You can find me on Twitter, Game of CR. Maybe someday on Twitch, Game uh, Caffeine underscore Rage. And if you wish to be my friend on Steam, Caffeine Rage over there as well. And you've been... Gaming Psychologist. You can find me on the YouTube's by searching for Gaming Psychologist on Twitter at JMA4707. And if you want to be my, be my friend on Steam, send that to jarthur4707. If you want to let me know exactly what episode of the podcast you're coming from, your password for this week is audio podcast. It's an audio podcast, Jared. Stop with the it uh, is stop, an with, audio podcast. stop with the uh, visual stuff. Audio. Look at that. Look at that picture over there. Look at that. Look at that link. Just be glad you can't see him because yo, he's probably not wearing pants. Let's be perfectly honest here. You're right. I'm not wearing pants. Well, uh, well, uh, good thing I don't have a YouTube monetization anymore because I, would, I lost it right there. Yeah, nobody wants to see my nethers. <laughs> yeah, especially me. So stop it. <laughs> You're not my dad. That could be in the episode <laughs> title. You're not my dad. Don't make me get the nunchucks. Uh, but if you was to contribute to this absolute madness, you could do so at vglpodcast at gmail.com with your letters, voicemails, gaming related topics, or tweet them to us over at the Dead Bird VGL Podcast on the Twitter. Our lovely, lovely ma- uh, patrons, for some reason, make this uh, madness possible. You can find out more at patreon.com slash VGL Podcast. And our lovely patrons also make the Podbean account possible. VGLpodcast.podbean.com was hosts the show notes, RSS feed, links to everything we do online. Or you can find us on iTunes, Google Play, or your podcatcher of choice. Our intro and outro music is On the Ground by Kevin McLeod, and our Discovery Cube music is doobly do by the same artist. You can find his work over at incomputech.com and... As always, as his lovely music starts to roll across my voice... Bye-bye now. See you next time. Bye-bye.